three months. Uh, learning the art of loving. There was a, a young man who uh, was in love with a girl, quite head over heels actually, and one day he was composing a letter to his true love, and uh, he's writing down on paper to this girl's dreams like this, darling, I would climb the highest mountain, I would cross the swiftest, deepest flowing river. I would cross the burning desert. I'd be willing to burn at the stake. I would do just whatever I needed to, to love you and show my love for you and, and to know that you love me. P.S. I see you on Saturday if it's not raining. Over the past several months, we've been learning about the art of loving. And it's my hope and it's my prayer that we're starting to grasp the contrary to the young man in the story, love is more than just words. The Apostle John tells us that we are to love with words and deeds. In other words, if it's just talk, that's all it is. It's just talk. True biblical love is demonstrated by action. We actually choose to put feet to our words. And we choose to put feet to our intentions. And we demonstrate love for one another in very practical, concrete, real ways. And we've been talking about that over the last number of weeks. These one another statements are just very practical ways that we can love each other. Well, the kind of love we Christians are called to is, is quite different from what most people in our world think of when they hear the word love. The love that we are commanded to practice is not sexual love. The love we're called to practice is not merely the affection that should normally and naturally come amongst family members. The love that we are called to practice is not even that deep, you know, love that's found between really good friends or in a really good marriage. The love that we are to practice as Christians is a special kind of love, there's a special word for it, it's called agape love. And as we've noted in previous weeks, agape is a principle by which we deliberately live. It, it has to do with the will. It's a deliberate conviction of the mind issuing forth in a deliberate policy of life. We say, I'm going to choose to love this person that's the principle. I'm going to love them. I'm going to choose to love them. And then I actually act out that love in very concrete, real ways. For those who are controlled by Christ, love is a determined or a chosen way of life. Love is something that's active, not passive. It primarily gives rather than gets. Love is a way of life which finds its source in God. And this is what Jesus is getting at when he told his disciples that he had a new command for them. A command which would set the benchmark for what it means to be his disciples. And I find it very interesting that Jesus doesn't set the benchmark as in, here's 700 laws I want you to keep. He sets it in one action founded in one very solid principle. You are to love one another. That's how everybody's going to know that you belong to me. He wasn't asking them to love according to the golden rule, you know, to do unto others so that they'll do it back unto me. He wasn't even asking them to love according to the law. Do you remember how he summed up the law? 
In Matthew 22, he said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. And another uh, gospel he adds, and all your strength. He says, this is the first and the greatest commandment. The second is like it, you shall love your neighbors yourself. And then he makes this commentary, he says, all of the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. I mean, these two commandments are foundational and fundamental to every other law in the scriptures. But Jesus doesn't say that's the basis of how we're supposed to love. No, Jesus set a new standard with his new commandment. He said, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another, even as I have loved you, that you also love one another. For by this, by this love you have for one another, it looks just like my love for you. By this, all men will know that you are my disciples, if you have loved one for another. You know, the golden rule was really based on a self-centered motive. I will love you because I want you to love me back. There was no basis there for agape love. Neither could the law provide an adequate basis for agape love. To love others as you love yourself was also doomed to failure because it was based on a self-limited motive. If love for others is contingent on love for oneself, well, what happens if and when, for whatever reason, we are unable or unwilling to love ourselves. Not even the law could provide an adequate basis for the kind of love Jesus wanted his disciples to put into practice. So Jesus gave the new commandment with its instruction to love one another as I have loved you. To love as Christ loves. Could there ever be a love greater or more noble or more all-encompassing than that? Could we ever have a better example of love than Jesus? And yet there must be something more than merely imitating Jesus if we would love, actually love, the way that he loves. We get glimpses of this in the teaching that Jesus gave us even on the night when he told his disciples about the new commandment. Uh, Jesus taught them and he's teaching us about the need for us to be connected to him in a living relationship so that we can experience his life in us. When he used uh, the analogy of the vine and the branches, he made it very clear. What did he say? He said, without me, you can do nothing. That's fairly categorical. Without me, you can do nothing. In other words, Jesus told us that unless his life is actually in us, we will not, and in fact, we will not be able to produce any fruit or to live in any of the ways that are consistent with him who is the vine. So in relation to this business of loving as he loves, as he commands us in his new commandment, what Jesus is essentially telling us is that the only way we can love like Jesus is if and only if he lives in us and then loves through us. And it is this principle of the Christian life which we want to think about today. It's only if he lives in us and loves through us that we're going to be able to love the way we're called to love. So if you have your Bibles, turn to Ephesians chapter 3. And in this chapter, Paul prays a prayer which I think holds the key to living a life of love. So Ephesians chapter 3, verse 14. Paul says, For this reason I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name, that he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with power through his spirit in the inner man, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, and that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ which surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled up to all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly beyond all that we ask or think, according to the power that works within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. 
Oh, Amen. The only way we can love like Jesus is if he lives in us and loves through us. That's the only way we're ever going to love like Jesus. If he lives in us and then loves through us. So notice what Paul is saying in his prayer for the Ephesians. First of all, he's telling us that God wants us to be full of him, of God, and to experience the riches of his glory, of God's glory. Verse 16 and then 19. He says that he would grant you to be filled up to the fullness of God. Now this is a very extraordinary statement. God wants us to be full of himself. God wants us, the created, to be full of him, the creator. God wants us, the redeemed, to be full of him, the redeemer. God wants us, who are finite, to be full of him, who is infinite. Does anybody catch the problem here? God's a pretty big person, right? To be full of him, all that he is. How does that happen? God wants us to be full of Christ. What Paul says here is, is not kind of just a one-off statement that, you know, he just he had a revelation in the middle of this prayer and that was it. And in the very next chapter, Paul speaks of us attaining to the measure of the stature which belongs to the fullness of Christ. It's in Christ. It's in Christ alone in whom we have every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, he says in Colossians, or in Ephesians 1. In Colossians, Paul tells us that it was the Father's good pleasure for all the fullness, that is, of God, to dwell in him, Christ. The writer to the Hebrews instructs us that Jesus is the radiance of his glory, that is the Father's glory, and he's the exact representation of the Father's nature, and he upholds all things by the word of his power. See, God wants us to be full of him, and he wants us to experience the riches of his glory, and all that God is and all that God has is ours in the person of the Son of God. Our Lord Jesus Christ. And that's Paul's point here in Ephesians chapter 3. We are to be full of God, but who is it that lives in us? It's Jesus Christ, who is very God and very God. So God wants us to be full of himself and to experience the riches of his glory. But we, secondly, can only experience God as his spirit imparts to us the life of Christ. We can only experience God in our lives as the Holy Spirit imparts to us the life of Jesus Christ. Notice what Paul says, and I, I've changed the order of the words a little bit to help us get the point that Paul is making in the text. He prays that we might be strengthened in the inner man through his spirit so that Christ may dwell in your hearts. You know, we err if we think that we can experience God the Father and or God the Son apart from God the Holy Spirit. Nowhere in the New Testament do we find a pattern different from this. If you study the life of Jesus carefully, you, you discover that he lived out his life in full dependence upon the Holy Spirit of God. In fact, this was so much so that Jesus and the Holy Spirit worked in harmony with each other that, that Jesus told his disciples that when he, Jesus, went back to the Father, the Holy Spirit would come and would continue to be with them, fulfilling exactly the same role that he, Jesus, had had with them. And if you read through John's uh, Gospel, 14 through 17, and, and in the book of Acts, you, you, you come to that conclusion. But one of the things Jesus said was, he said, I'm going to send you another helper, another one who's alongside of you, another paraclete. What's he saying? He's saying, well, I am your helper, your alongside one, your paraclete. I'm going to send you another one, the Holy Spirit, to continue what I've been doing. Now, biblically, if you would have the Father, you must also have the Son and the Spirit. Um, it can't be any other way. If you would have the Son, you must have the Father and the Spirit. If you would have the Spirit, you must have the Father and the Son. We worship a triune God, one God, three persons, and we cannot experience or know God in any other way. If you want to know God the Father, you must know Jesus, you must know the Spirit. And if you want to know Jesus, you better understand the Father and the Spirit. 
And if you want to understand how the Spirit works, you need to know how the Father works and how Jesus works. You see, God wants us to be full of Him and to experience the riches of His glory, experience all that He is. We can only experience God as His Spirit imparts to us the life of Christ. And, and what this hints at, and at the very least, and we're going to come to this in a bit, but what this hints at, at the very least, is that if we want to really know God, and we want to have a relationship with Christ, and we really want to know Christ, we must, we absolutely must, open up our lives to the Holy Spirit of God, the Spirit of Jesus Christ. So God wants us to be full of Him and to experience the riches of His glory. And we can only experience God as His Spirit imparts to us the life of Christ. And then thirdly, only as Christ dwells in our hearts can we comprehend and know the love of Christ. Only as Christ dwells in our hearts can we comprehend and know the love of Christ. Paul says in chapter 3 here, that Christ may dwell in your hearts that you may comprehend and know the love of Christ. The knowledge of Christ's love, which Paul has in mind, is not merely intellectual comprehension, although that is part of it. Rather, it is, if I quote out of Bruce, it is a personal acquaintance with the Revealer whose nature is perfect love. And he goes on and says, to know the love of Christ is to know Christ himself, in ever widening experience and to have his outgoing and self-denying love reproduced in oneself. It could not be otherwise if he dwells in his people and they in him. You see, if we actually know Jesus, and I mean know him, not just up here, but down here, if we actually know him, have a relationship with him, there's one thing that's going to happen. We will be filled with his life, filled with his love, and we will become more and more like him over time. And that's exactly the point Paul is getting across to the Ephesians. You know, I have a friend who's a police officer. And uh, one of the service training modules that he had to do was, uh, he, he had to, which he took, he took to, to learn to be, have increased effectiveness in road patrol, in particular, learn how to deal with drunk drivers. But, but part of the training that these officers had to uh, take, they actually had to get drunk and then try driving in that condition. Now, the purpose of the exercise wasn't to give the officers a free party. What was intended was that they would know from first-hand experience what it's like to be drunk, so that they might better understand the people they're going to have to deal with. And you know, there's something to learn from the experience of being drunk that textbooks and lectures and observation is never going to communicate. You have to experience it. Well, you know, it's fine for us who are Christians to read the Bible and to study the Bible and to hear sermons about the love of God in Christ and to watch other believers who seem to know something about Christ's love and observe their lives and go, wow, that's very interesting. But nothing absolutely nothing can substitute for the depth and the intimacy of knowledge which comes from a personal experience of Christ's love in me. Which comes from a personal experience of Christ's love as one who has a real and an intimate relationship with Him. You know, before I met Bev, I, I could have read doctoral dissertations about her and talked to all of her friends to find out about her. And I could have even had a, you know, a calendar made with a different picture for every month and her favorite quotations for the month that I could review every day of the month. I, I, I would have learned all kinds of really good stuff, stuff that's good to know. But it wasn't until April the 7th, 1990, that I really began to experience and comprehend and really know what a love relationship with Bev was all about. Do you see the difference? I fear there are many who say that they are Christ's who only know him from afar. They, they've read about him. 
They studied about him. They heard about him. They, they may even have a faith or a measure of trust in him at some level, but they don't really know him. The relationship has never become personal and alive and intimate. It's never migrated from the head to the heart. And when we talk about loving the way Christ loves, it's as foreign as eating chapatis and speaking Hindi. We will never and never be able to love the way Christ loves and as he's commanded us to love until we open up our hearts to him and experience his love personally in increasing measure as we walk with him and we fellowship with him day by day. Only as Christ dwells in our heart can we comprehend and know the love of Christ. Number four, the active ingredient in this way of living and be loving is faith. The active ingredient in this way of living and loving is faith. Paul says, verse 17, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. As I read the scriptures, and particularly uh, the parts of the epistles which teach about ethics, you know, teach about how to live the Christian life as a disciple in very practical ways, it comes home to me over and over again how unable I am to actually live out in my life the things that the scriptures talk about. Paul is describing what life looks like when Christ lives his life in and through us. And if I want my life to look like that of Christ, then it's absolutely certain that I must have Christ living his life in me and through me, or I will never in any shade look like Jesus. You know, if you uh, eat some red hot chili peppers, you know what happens next, right? Your mouth begins to burn, and your eyes start to water, and you feel flush from about here up, and maybe your stomach gets agitated too. And you feel the urge to drink some liquid to cool off the heat. Has anybody done this? Yeah, okay, good. Now, if you have ever drunk water to lessen the heat, as I have, what you find out is that it doesn't work. In fact, it usually makes the problem worse. I first learned this when I was over at uh, some people in Three Hills, the Amstel City, the missionaries in India, and they hosted all the East Indian students at their house and had an East Indian meal. And they asked me to come because I was dating their daughter. <laughs> so I was over there and I loved the food, but man, is it hot. And so I'm gulping down the water, and all these East Indians, they're looking like. <laughs> <laughs> you need to eat yogurt. I don't like yogurt. Well, I guess you're going to burn. <laughs> you know, and I learned that you need to drink something different than water. If you drink another liquid called milk, you discover that milk lessens the effect of the hot peppers. Now, both milk and water are liquids, aren't they? Well, that's what all they have in common when it comes to the hot pepper problem. Water isn't going to do it. You can drink water till the cows come home, if you'll pardon that bigger speech, and you won't be helped one little bit. But drink some milk, and in the milk you will find what is needed to lessen the heat. Well, similarly, you're wondering how am I going to make that fit, right? Well, similarly, if you want to experience, if we want to experience in our lives those outcomes which come from the life of Christ, we will actually need to have Christ living within us. Our own life, like the water with the peppers, is powerless to produce what is needed. And we can try harder, and we can try harder, and we can try harder to get those desired outcomes, and all our efforts will result in frustration. But when Christ lives within us, and we allow him to live his life in us and through us, we find that those things which, we, which are characteristic of him begin to be evident in our lives as well. 
And it's because his life is being made manifest in us. And as Paul puts it, it's Christ in me, the hope of glory. And where all of my effort before got me nowhere, now as I have Christ living in me and I rest in him and allow him to live through me, suddenly, guess what happens? I'm starting to live in ways that look like Jesus. Amazing, isn't it? In the new commandment, Jesus is telling us that we must love as he loved. It's not an option. We must love as he loves. And do you know something? We are utterly unable to do so. Only if Jesus lives in me do I have any hope of actually loving the way that Jesus loves. So how do I go about having Jesus live in me? Well, obviously... We have to begin somewhere. So we begin by opening up the door of our heart and inviting him in. Revelation chapter 3, Jesus says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. And if any man will open the door, I'll come in. I'll fellowship with him. Over relationship. I'll start to live with you and live in you. And I'll be in your heart. That's where we start. We open up the door of our heart. We invite him in. And the Bible tells us that we must turn away from our sin. We must ask him to forgive us of our sin. We must put our trust in him to be our Savior and our Lord. Because that's what he's after. We need to deal with the problem that's kept him out of our heart, which is our sin. And we deal with that by saying, Lord, I know I'm a sinner. And here's the stuff I've done. I know I've done stuff that doesn't please you. I've said things that don't please you. I've thought things that do not please you. Lord, here it is. I'm confessing it to you. And you promise in your word that if I confess my sins, you'll be faithful and just to forgive me my sins and to cleanse me from all unrighteousness. That's where we begin. Because that's what Jesus is going to address first thing. But, you know, I think there's something that we've missed in our evangelical theology of conversion, which has left a lot of people spiritually dead in the water. We've told them that, you know, if you pray a prayer, you're saved. And I've met people. I remember a guy called Dusty Box. I worked with him in construction. And he said to me, he says, oh, yeah, I said, I tried that. I tried Jesus. It didn't work. I prayed that prayer. And they told me as a Christian. It didn't work. I'm afraid we've taught people that if you just say those words, it's kind of like magic, so then bingo, something happens. And yes, a person might need to say all the right words, but they've never encountered the living Christ. And they've never truly entered into a relationship with him. It was just a mantra that somebody told them to say, and they said it, and nothing changed, because they never met Jesus. When we truly repent of our sin and we ask God to forgive us of our sin and we invite him to come into our heart and come into our life, that's only the beginning of a relationship which can grow and become more and more precious as the years go by. And when he comes in, he doesn't come in to just please sit by the door there, I'll talk to you on the way out when I'm going out sometime. No, when he comes into our heart, he comes in not to be our servant, but to be our master. He comes in to run the show, if you wish. To, to be the one who controls us. And guards us and guides us and does all the things he promises to do. You know, if I would have said to Bev the day after our wedding, well, I'm going to get on with the, next, with the rest of my life now. You know, I've gotten married, and so that's taken care of. Now on to the next thing. See you later. I mean, if, if I would have said something like that, you'd think that I was a few bricks shy of a load, wouldn't you? That's not why you get married. A person doesn't get married just so that they can, you know, tick one more thing off the to-do list and then carry on with the rest of life. A person gets married in order to begin a relationship that is able to go to depths never before possible. Because now we're committed, we're united, we're working together towards a common goal. When we come to Christ, it's not so that we can just tick off something on our spiritual to-do list. 
When we come to Christ for salvation, that's only the beginning of a relationship that can and should grow and deepen and give and as we give ourselves to it and we learn to love him and we learn to trust him more and more and more. So that as we look back over the course of our life, we say, man, I, I see where I've come from and I know him better than I did five years ago or three years ago or whatever length it was. I know him better. I trust him more. He's more the one controlling me. But well, not controlling in the sense that sometimes we like to control people, but no, he, he motivates and animates and fills me so much that nothing I want more than to please him. Paul tells us that Christ dwells in our hearts through faith. In other words, by faith we get to know him more and more and more. And by faith we come to experience in real ways, in real time, his life in us more and more and more. As we read the scriptures, God speaks to us and he shows us how he wants us to live. And, and, and if we're being honest, I think we're going to realize that we can't be and do what he's asking. And so we really need to ask Jesus to live his life in us so that his life in us becomes evident in us outwardly. And by faith, we ask him and we trust him to do so in very specific ways. So, for example, if you go to Ephesians chapter 4, you, you read some things and, and you, you might pray like this Lord Jesus, please help me to walk in a manner worthy of the calling that you've placed on me. Because Paul tells us that's how we're supposed to live. It's actually God telling us that. Or we might pray, Lord Jesus, help me to have humility gentleness as I interact with other people. Because that's how Jesus is. He's humble and he's gentle. Lord Jesus, help me to be that way, just like you. Lord Jesus, help me to be patient and forbearing today. Lord Jesus, please live your life out of me today as I encounter X, Y, or Z situation. Lord, I know I'm dealing with this thing. Would you please help me to do that in a way that shows that you're living in me. Live your life out of me in that situation. And one of the health issues my mom had in her last two or three years was dehydration. And uh, I'd visit her and you know, gently remind her, Mother, are you drinking enough water? And she'd always point to the cup beside her chair and say, Oh yes, there's the water that's right there in the cup. Yeah, I'm, I'm drinking water. Funny thing was, the level of the cup never changed. It was always the same amount of water in the cup. The cup was there, the water was there, but the water stayed in the cup and, and she didn't get the fluid that she needed. The water was available, but she wasn't appropriating it for her daily needs. And I understand the reasons why she didn't. Any of us get older, we understand these things, right? But you know, many of us as Christians are like that. At some point, yes, we, we pray a prayer and, and uh, we have a general trust in God for our lives. And, and yes, Jesus lives within us, but we aren't appropriating his life in our, for our daily needs. We don't draw on all that he is and all that he's promised to do in and for and through us. And we wonder why we're struggling, why there's no power, there's no life. Imagine, though, being able to experience his life in you, his life flowing through you, no matter what it is you're called to face. Imagine that. And the blessed truth is, you actually can. Simply by faith, choose to reach out and ask and receive all that is needed for the life that you're being called to live. That's what the scripture teaches us. You know, over these past number of weeks, we've been thinking about Jesus' new commandment. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another, even as I have loved you, that you also love one another. For by this, 
all men will know that you are my disciples if you have love one for another. Well, might we ask ourselves how we can possibly be able to do what he says. The answer lies in this prayer of the Apostle Paul in Ephesians chapter 3, which we've been thinking about this morning. For this reason, he says, I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name, that he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with power through his Spirit in the inner man, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, and that you, being rooted and grounded in love, who is Christ? Christ is love personified. That you, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ, which surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled up to all the fullness of God. Now, to him who is able, who is able to do abundantly, exceedingly, beyond all that we ask or think according to the power that works within us, to him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus for all generations forever and ever. Amen. God wants us to be full of him and to experience the riches of his glory. We can only experience God as his spirit imparts to us the life of Christ. Only as Christ dwells in our hearts can we comprehend and know the love of Christ. The active ingredient in this way of living and loving <laughs> Father, thank you that you haven't asked us to do something that's impossible. It is impossible if we try to do it in our own power, in our own strength, in our own might, our own wisdom, whatever. But you haven't asked us to do something that we cannot do. You've asked us to do something which we can do as we experience the life of Jesus in us. Communicated to us by your Holy Spirit. Something that's very, very real. Very powerful. Very personal. Very intimate. Lord, I pray that thinking that somehow this Christian life is all about us trying to perform and, and do all of this in our own ability or strength. Because if that's what we're trying to do, it's going to be like one guy said, it's going to be like trying to push a bus up a hill. It'll just be hard and unpleasant and we won't get anywhere. What you're asking us to do is to surrender. To surrender ourselves to you and say, Lord Jesus, would you please come and live in my heart by your spirit. Fill me with yourself, with your life, with your power, with your love. So that I can live in the ways you're calling me to live. And it's not going to be all this hard work anymore. It's going to be simply allowing you to live through me as I live in step with you and agree with you, walk with you, fellowship with you, and know you. Lord, help us to be done with this idea that the Christian life is just an ethical code that somehow we have to do. It's so much more. It's actually a relationship with Christ and knowing him daily, personally, really. Lord, help us to live there. Take this to heart. And Lord, where it hasn't been explained very well, would you, Spirit, make it clear? Because what we want is to live in relationship with you, our God, our Master, our Friend. 
Thank you, Lord Jesus. Go with us now as we leave here. For we pray in Jesus' name.